Okay. Um, stealing, right or wrong? Quick. Wrong. Today I've ripped off a message. I am totally stealing this message from Faith Walkers Conference. Uh, I've ripped it off. I've altered it. Abbreviated it. It's uh, added some things in that came thinking. So it's a version of a teaching given by Pastor Tom Brown at Faith Walkers this year. And I really recommend that 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 uh, you just go and listen to the original. So I'm going to give you a taste of it, and hopefully uh, it excites you to go listen to this message. But it's it was a powerful, powerful teaching. Uh, and all the messages are there, as Rachel was saying too. Turn to the Book of Revelation, chapter five. In Sunday school class today, the author of the book we're studying, not a fan, says, whenever I get angry, I start quoting from Revelation. I really don't know if that's an admirable thing or not. But uh, anyways, Revelation chapter 5. We've taught on this chapter before, and I think I ended up crying that day. Uh, when I study this chapter, it's hard not to cry, and I, I can remember just reading it at home and just blubbering. But powerful, powerful chapter. So John, the revelator, uh, John is uh, in exile, and while in exile, he receives this vision from God. He gets to see what heaven is like. Are you curious? He gets to see what it's like to be in heaven. So Revelation chapter 5. I'm just going to read the whole chapter. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, so God the Father, I saw in his right hand a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. You can just imagine this scene in heaven and people are looking around, or John at least is looking around waiting. Who's going to step forward and open this scroll? This scroll, just to let you know, is uh, the scroll that's going to undo all of the evil on earth. It's going to bring God's wrath down on, on sin and wickedness, and it's going to make things right. We live in a broken world. We live in a world of tears. We live in a world of death. We live in a world of suffering, and God's not going to wait forever. He's going to come down. He's going to establish his kingdom of, of goodness and righteousness. And so they're waiting. Who can open this scroll? And nobody comes forward. Nobody in heaven is worthy to open that scroll. Next, verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who is worthy to open the scroll or even look inside. And so here's John the Baptist, not John the Baptist, I'm sorry. Here's John the Revelator, here's John the disciple John. He's in heaven. He's in this vision in heaven, all this glory and all this beauty. Who's going to bring salvation? Who's, who's going to... Who's going to fix things on the planet? Who can open this scroll? And nobody can. And he just says, he says, I wept and wept. It's been just tears of anguish, just sobbing because nobody is going to be able to make things right. I wept and I wept because no one was able to, uh, was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, we're talking about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's victorious. He's the hero. He is able to open the scroll in its seven seals. And I saw a lamb looking as if, as if it had been slain. So the lion, this mighty lion, appears as, as a lamb that looked like it had been killed with wounds on it. And the Lamb of God is standing in the center before the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. And this is a symbol of power and authority. The horns are power, authority. He's got all the power and authority. It's like a big ram prancing in his territory. You know, He rules. Jesus Christ comes in. This Lamb rules. And seven eyes is all knowledge and all wisdom belongs to the one with authority. Isn't that a good thing? How often do the people with authority seem not to have the knowledge and the wisdom? Here we have seven in, in Hebrew thought. In Jewish thought is the idea of perfection. He has perfect power, perfect uh, authority, and he has perfect wisdom to go with it. So here's the lamb that was slain with perfect power and, and perfect authority. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went 
and he seized the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So imagine this scene in heaven. These bowls, these golden bowls, are full of this sweet perfume. And what is the perfume? It's the prayers of God's people. All the people throughout all the ages, God's people have cried, said, Lord, this world is messed up and broken. Please come. Please do something. God, save us. God saves those prayers in these, in these precious bowls. and they're, they're, they're perf- It's like perfume filling the throne room. Every time somebody prays, oh, Lord God, I'm so sick of my sin. I'm so sick of my pride, how self-righteous. I'm so hard on people. Lord, what is wrong with me? And these prayers go up before God. And God says, I'm going to do something about it. See, those prayers are saved. And God in heaven is going to do something about it. Uh, Each one had a harp, and they were holding the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God members of every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And isn't it beautiful? When this was written about 90 A.D. approximately, somewhere around there, before 100 A.D. Uh, John, John is an old man at this point. He's in his 90s. When that's written, Christianity was already, because of the Apostle Paul and others, spread to India. It had already been spread to Rome. It was already going out every place. But not until our lifetime has Christianity gone to every language on the planet. And so this prophesied that Christianity would be in every language, that there'd be a church in every country. Today, there is at least a church in every single country on the planet. Christianity has gone out to the entire world. What an amazing prophecy that we've seen fulfilled right in our lifetimes. Uh, You have made them to be a kingdom. So all these diverse people, they're speaking all these different languages. They are one kingdom, and they are kingdom, and they are priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. They will rule. Then I look in looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. They encircled the throne, all these angelic beings and the living creatures and the elders and the loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, honor and glory and praise. And did you hear a couple, it was like two, three weeks ago, uh, this was in the news, it's unbelievable, the, the crowd, the stadium in Seattle, for the Seattle Seahawks, they got so loud that they tripped the Richter scale. It registered as a small earthquake. Imagine what thousands and thousands, 10,000 times, 10,000, all these angelic beings saying in a loud voice, circling the throne of God, worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all of them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow. You know, because I'm a geek, sometimes I think, boy, I hope Christ doesn't come back before the new Star Wars movie didn't comes out. How, how, how ridiculous. These are, these are special effects. This is going to be something. Why did John react the way he did? Why was he so emotional? Think about John's life. Old man in his 90s, all his life working hard. He, he walked with Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus Christ die. He saw his resurrection. He saw the church scattered. He saw Jerusalem the city of God destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 A.D. Many of his friends, all the other disciples, he's seen them one by one die for their faith. Imagine that, that one of you guys in your 90s can say, yeah, all the other folks in church died for their faith. I'm still standing. Many of his friends had been killed for their faith. The same Jesus he walked with, ate with, he saw die on a Roman cross and and the glory of his resurrected body, he saw that. He endured persecution himself. He's in, he was in, in prison. Now he's in, in exile. He labored long and weary years to tell people Jesus loves you. And people hated him for it. 
to tell people heaven is, heaven's doors, the gates to heaven are open. You can go. Humble yourself. Accept forgiveness from God. And people despised him for sharing that message. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. He has poured out his life for the church of Christ. The, Jesus Christ calls, the Bible calls the church the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. So what an insult to Jesus himself if you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I can't stand the church. Think about that. I would not really be patient with somebody who talks about my bride that way. There would be trouble. He has poured out his life for the church of Christ, and now in this vision, he's standing in the very presence of God. God's going to make things right. Finally, the, all his life, everything he dreamed about, worked about, fought about, he's seen his friends die for this. He's in heaven. And who can open up this scroll that's going to make things right? And nobody shows up. Nobody shows up. The cold, hard reality is no one else in heaven could open the scroll, not the angels, not Peter or Paul or John himself. And then the Lion of Judah, looking like a lamb that was sacrificed for our sins, sacrificed because I'm a hard-headed idiot sometimes, because I'm so hard to be around sometimes, sacrificed because of my sin, my pride, Sacrifice, he goes up and he seizes the throne and the whole place goes crazy. And everybody starts saying, yes, 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 you are worthy because you gave yourself to save these people. You offered your life to save these people. Jesus does what nobody else can do. Pastor Brown points out sometimes we just need to relax and be saved because Jesus Christ is the hero of the story. No one else in heaven was the hero of the story. History, in history, Jesus Christ is the hero. In my life, in your life, who's the hero? Jesus Christ. The spotlight goes to Jesus Christ. Remember John the Baptist? He should increase, I will decrease. He stepped out of the spotlight. Jesus Christ is the center. You're not the hero of your own story. Jesus Christ is. And we sometimes just need to relax and say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You can do what I can't do. Jesus Christ can do things that nobody else can do. You know what? When, you know what's bad for a marriage? It's when a husband expects his wife to be Jesus Christ for him. Or when a wife expects her husband to be Jesus Christ. He ain't, she ain't. You're going to have a better marriage when you realize that. Well, guess what? You can lose your peace. You can lose your faith, your walk with the, with the Holy Spirit when you try to be Jesus Christ. When you try to be the Savior, there's only one Savior. And you can't take his job, and I can't take his job. Jesus can do things that we cannot do. And Pastor uh, Brown says some people end up throwing away their faith because they feel so hopeless. And I, I, you know, I'm supposed to be perfect, and I'm not, and I'm supposed to do all this, and they give up. Well, the only perfect one was Jesus Christ. The only one who never sinned was Jesus Christ. The one who can die and give his life to save others was Jesus Christ. We can die, but our death can't even pay for our own sins, let alone everybody else's. Pastor Brown says, don't throw your faith away, throw your burden away. That's worth an amen, isn't it? Don't throw your faith away, throw your burden away. The Lion of Judah grabs the scroll because no one else could. And that's worth celebrating. And this reminded me of a song from the 1980s by, by Steve Taylor. Uh, yeah, Steve Taylor. In this, the name of the song was called Hero. I've actually quoted from the song several times, and I'm kind of wondering maybe I did it last time we studied Romans, or, or Revelation chapter 5. These words meant so much to me as a young adult. Please listen. You got to hear it with a new wave kind of David Boyd kind of voice. Uh, when the house fell asleep, there was always a light, and it fell from the page to the eyes of an American boy. In a storybook land, I could dream what I read. When I went, when it went to my head, I'd see, I want to be a hero. I love seeing young boys that want to grow up to be heroes. I want to be a hero, but the practical side said the question was still. 
when you grow up, what will you be? I want to be a hero. Hero, it's a nice boy notion that the real world's going to destroy. You know it's a Marvel comic book, Saturday matinee fairy tale boy. Growing older, you'll find that illusions are brought, and the idol you thought you'd be was just another zero. I want to be a hero. Heroes died when the squealers bought them off, died when the dealers got them off. Welcome to the in for the money as an idol show. When they ain't as big as life, when they ditch their second wife, where's the boy to go? Got to be a hero. And that resonated with me. Wanted to be the hero. Wanted to be good. And I couldn't even, not only can I not save other people, I can't even save myself. Wanting to be good and having to deal with anger and lust and pride and all these nasty things. I don't want that to be a part of me. And yet, it is. And I'm not the hero of my own story. And Steve Taylor goes on, When the house fell asleep, from a book I was led to a light that I never knew. I want to be your hero. This message from the book, the Bible. And he spoke to my heart from the moment I prayed. Here's a pattern I made for you. I want to be your hero. And Jesus Christ is the hero. Brothers and sisters, that's so good. I'm not. I confess it. But I've got a real hero. And he's done it for me. He went to the cross for me. He went to the cross for you. So you don't have to pay the penalty of every nasty thing you've ever said and done. Forgiveness was bought by the blood of the Lamb. We've got a hero. And he is worthy to receive all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And I'm free because I don't have to be the hero but I get to be his sidekick. <laughs> I get to follow him. I get to go where he goes. And he says, I've got a rescue mission. You coming? And I say, I'm in. I'm going. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out there and save the world. And I say, let me be a part of that. And he says, that's good. You can come along. We get to go to work with Daddy. Isn't that wonderful? Then uh, Pastor Tom Brown quoted from this guy named Tulian Chizhevijdan, he's a pastor. Uh, really, T C H I V I D J I A N. <laughs> Name of the book was Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Anybody read that book? Anybody familiar with it? Yeah. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He points out because Jesus was somebody for us. I'm free to be nobody. Because Jesus was extraordinary for us, I'm free to be ordinary. Because Jesus was sufficient for us, I'm free to be insufficient. Jesus is the hero of the story, not me. And it kind of reminds me of the liberation from, coming, from knowing I'm going to die. Trying to preserve everything, trying to preserve, trying to preserve, trying to... No, you're going to die. That being said, right now you're free to tear it up for the kingdom of God. You're going to die anyways. And are you going to hell or are you going to heaven? And once you've got that sorted out, use your life here to tear it up for the kingdom of God. We're going to get after 2014. We're going to see how many more people can change your eternal destiny from, from hell to heaven. And knowing this sets me free to thrill in the privilege of working with my Savior to bring others in this same freedom. It's called grace. Grace is not for perfect people. Jesus even said, I didn't even come for those people who think they're perfect. Grace is for messed up people. Give grace to people that you think don't deserve your love. Well, if we don't give grace to undeserving people, what is grace for? And, and, by the same token, understand that grace is for you when you fall. When we're walking strong, it's because of the grace of Jesus. And we mess it up and blow up on a daily basis, we fall on the grace of Jesus. And here's another thing. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and forgave all your sins, past, present, future, what does that mean? That when you're up front doing a great job like Cameron and Stephen and Rachel, that was amazing, and you brought PowerPoints, which is I've never done in 10 years at our church, and, 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 and chat, that was so beautiful. And then the worship team, and when you're standing up front, when you're teaching Sunday school class, when you're handing out flyers in your neighborhood, Jesus doesn't love you more 
then we've just blown it and said the worst things possible, things that you should never say to your husband or your wife or your friend or your child. Jesus loves you just as much then because he doesn't love you based on your goodness. He loves you because of his goodness. And it's not, it's the love of God that makes me want to please him. Lord, I want to be more like you. I want to I love holiness. I love the beauty of holiness and righteousness. You've shown it to me, God. It's so good. I want to be like you, not to glorify myself because, but because you are so glorious and I want to be near that. So we're set free because of grace. Yeah, I fail. I get back up again. I wasn't saved by my own goodness in the first place. I was saved by grace. Tom Brown then told a story. He said, I saw an old friend at the conference. So you see an old friend, you're happy to see it. I went over to talk to him, and he didn't even say hi to me. He turned his back to me. And he started walking away. And instead of saying hi, all he said is, my son took off. He's gone. There was a crowd of people. There was a 1,000 people at this conference. And people are going out to lunch and we moved pretty quick on the way to lunch break. And there's this little kid, and he's lost in the crowd. And his dad has said, i got to find my kid. And Tom Brown says, so what's the first thing I said to him? You got a stick of gum? No. He says, what's he wearing? What's he look like? He's going to help him find his kid. His dad needed to get his kid. Why did Jesus come? The Bible says to purchase men for God. Why did you purchase your iPhone? Why do you purchase your jeans? Because he wanted them. Jesus came to buy you with his blood. Listen, because he wants you. Jesus Christ wants you. He wants to be with you. He wants you in the family. He doesn't know. He knows. He's God. He doesn't want me. Oh, yes, he does. He bled for you. We sacrifice our finances for the things we want. He sacrificed his life for what he wants. Brothers and sisters, he wants you. He wants you in the family. He's the God who would leave the 99 sheep to search for the one. In Isaiah 53, it speaks of the Messiah, his prophecy, hundreds of years before Jesus, rising from the grave and seizing the plunder of victory. And for years, that doesn't make sense to me. Plunder, that's like an army takes over something, they take all the cloth and the gold and the silver and the... Why is Jesus Christ plundering? Like a victorious general, Jesus claims what's his. He suffers. He dies on the cross. He rises again. And Matthew Henry, the great Christian scholar, said that Christians, if you're a Christian, people saved by Jesus, he said, you're a monument of grace. The army goes in there and they take all the monuments, they take all the statues, they take all the treasure, they take all the art. Remember in Matthew chapter 12 when Jesus said, he said, I am the strong man and I go into Satan's home. I tie him up and I take his stuff. Remember that? Jesus says, I go into Satan's home. I tie him up and I take his stuff. And that's all we are, by the way, to Satan. We're stuff, things. But Jesus took his plunder. Some translations say he took his booty, which is confusing for some modern readers. Jesus Christ took his, his plunder he plundered hell by his death and his resurrection. He deserves the reward of his suffering. He loves us. What is the plunder that he snatched out of hell? He went into Satan's home and took his plunder. It's you and me. We are the reward for his suffering. Jesus Christ loves us. And he, he breaks right into hell and says, these people are coming with me. They're my plunder. And you and I are trophies of grace. Pastor Tim Brown said this. He said, you, my friend, are the reward of his suffering. He doesn't need you to be any more than you are. He wants your heart. Isn't there freedom in that? I'm not the hero. Jesus is the hero. And today, God looks down from heaven, and he sees billions, billions of lost sheep he says, I got to go get my kids, just like that dad in the conference. I got to go get my kids because the stampede is moving and they're moving fast and they're not going to the cafeteria. They're on the highway to hell. Jesus Christ said it's a wide road and many are on it and it leads to destruction. And he looks down and he says, I got to go get my kids. 
2,905,788,000 people who don't know that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain for their sin who came to be their hero. Jesus loves the lost sheep. Jesus needs his kids. Will we help him find his children? Wouldn't a good friend say, what's your kid wearing? I'll help you find him. Jesus Christ saves us, snatches us from hell and says, I got to go get my kids. We'll help you look. We'll help what they look. What do they look like? Like everybody. <laughs> what color hair do they have? Every kind. Are they rich or poor? Yep. <laughs> educated or uneducated? You got it. Help me go get them. He's the hero and he's going on this mission. And Are we in or not? We want to be in. Then Pastor said, we're very possibly living in the last days, the closing moments of this epic drama of sin and salvation. We have an opportunity of joining God and reaching out and finding his children, part of the closing chapter of history. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been searching to find every lost sheep. If I say I love Jesus, I need to help him find his missing kids because our time is short. Well, listen, the full sermon is, is much better. Maybe I give you a taste Enough to go online and listen. I'll send that out, also that link out by email. All the messages from the conference are there. Brothers and sisters, isn't it fun? In some ways, a new year is arbitrary. You know, what's different from, from uh, the end of 2013 to the beginning of 2014? But I think it's healthy. It's good to, to this delineation, this marker, so we can refresh ourselves and renew ourselves. And you know what? Sometimes life wears us down, just like Brother Chet was talking about. Sometimes our energy gets sapped. Sometimes we start to have the wrong priorities. Let's refocus. Let's pray, God, help us. We want to see people saved. We want to see the kingdom of God expanded. We want to see Jesus Christ lifted high and glorified. And Lord, if you're willing, you've got a room full of people who say, Lord, here we are. Please use us. Amen. Uh, we got a special number from the choir right now. Uh, the, the, the Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.